So uh, I, I'm going to talk uh, just, and I, I know I don't have much time, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this idea of gender and expansiveness and what, I, I'm kind of more raising questions than having answers at this point, but it's something that concerns me. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to sort of talk you through very briefly why I think this matters. Uh, and I am going to be borrowing from many, many, many people's research. So I'm not going to be presenting a lot of my own findings until the end, uh, just a little bit. But we know that power activates the approach system, right? This is Decker Keltner's work. We've, we've got, had, had sort of decades of, of research on this. So it makes people generally feel more confident and optimistic, more likely to you know, see challenging situations as opportunities instead of threats, more likely to approach uh, and, and just pre present their authentic selves. I mean, my, my favorite quote about power is that power does not corrupt, but power reveals. And I think that's true. And I think that you know, we do associate it strongly with corruption, but it's partly because we're thinking first about social power, so power over others. We're not thinking about personal power, power to, or power over our own resources that we possess, like our knowledge, our, uh, our core values. I mean, the list goes on and on, but that's a kind of power. Um, and, and you know. Powerlessness really does the opposite. So it activates the inhibition system. It makes people feel negative and pessimistic and, and see these challenging situations as threats instead of opportunities. Uh, it makes them avoid instead of approach. And generally to present a constrained version of themselves, right? So if power reveals, powerlessness does the opposite. It puts a wall up. And you know, I kind of came to thinking of it, this relationship between power and the self partly as it was kind of in response to, to my TED talk and all these people writing, talking about these challenging situations. And what mattered to them most was not, did I get the job or not? Or whatever, did I do well on the test? It was how they felt when they left. Did they feel, and they would say things like, I didn't feel like I showed them who I was, or I did feel that way. That's what seemed to matter. The feeling that you bring your all to these challenges. So this, I think this idea that power is related to approach is mostly a good thing. I mean, we want a world full of people who feel personally powerful. I think it creates value for everybody. Um, now, <laughs> on to the, the part two. Power causes us to expand in many different ways. And this is related to the whole, the, sort of the approach system. It's, it's the same kind of idea. We open up. Um, it does the same thing with, with other animals as well. So when individuals have power, uh, they expand, they make themselves bigger, they take up space. Uh, you, I mean, you can clearly see here which one is the more powerful animal, right? There are so many ways in which this is exhibited uh, across the animal kingdom, peacocks, of course, but also in humans. And, and I wanna just, I'm gonna focus only on this one po particular posture. So this posture is the posture that's been studied um, by Jessica Tracy and her colleagues. Uh, really amazing work she's been doing this for, uh, probably 15 years now, looking at this posture and others, but this one in particular, all over the world. And what she finds is that the reason, I mean, the reason you have somebody standing like this before a gymnastics routine is because it, it signals victory, right? We know that, and that's why it's choreographed in gymnastics. But in most sports, it's not choreographed. And what Jessica, uh, Jessica Tracy has found is that all over the world, when people win first place, uh, they, throw their arms up in the air in a V, they lift their chin, they tend to open their mouths a bit, so they make themselves very expansive, open, vulnerable. And, uh, and, and let me just show you what this looks like in lots of different sports. So all of these people are winning, and this is what they do spontaneously without thinking about it. Even golf. <laughs> <coughs> this guy, 100 years old, won a 5K, pretty amazing. I was teaching in Cambodia in January, and you know, really very, very different culture, but you see the same kinds of things. Um, this is a baseball team that you may have heard of from Boston, uh, and this was in a better year when they were doing well. So here you have David Ortiz running the bases during a home run. Uh, so he, he, he has a home run, so he's running the bases, and this photo goes with that photo. So this is a Boston police officer at Fenway Park celebrating because his team is winning when there's an outfielder 
going over this you know, edge and possibly being head injured. So we feel this way on behalf of you know, our teams and our, our kin as well. So here you've got a whole stadium of people doing this. So, this is, so it, whether Jessica is looking at people winning or, or looking at you know, having them look at pictures of people in that posture, what she finds is the same. They, they associate it with power and pride. So this is a universal emotion expression, just as you know, smiling is, but it's, it's about posture much more so than the face. Uh, now, if you think about this for a second, it kind of, it doesn't really make sense. If you think about what this guy's done, so he's just run you know, 100 meters faster than any human in the history of the world. So he's already won, he has power, but now he's gonna you know, waste resources after using the, all the resources that he used to, to run that race. It's a little bit crazy, but it's not when you think about the social need to show people that you have power when you have it, even if it's fleeting. So that's why we do this spontaneously. I think the most convincing evidence, though, that this link is pretty, pretty hardwired, and I don't use that term loosely, uh, is that even congenitally blind athletes do the same thing. So people who've never seen anyone do this when they win first place, they do the same thing. They throw their arms up in the air in a victory pose. Uh, when you do poorly or when you're feeling like you're losing, when you feel powerless, you start to collapse. You, uh, and this is what Jessica Tracy's work I, it looks at as an expression of shame. I would say it's also a, a sort of a postural expression of fear and powerlessness. So you see all this con sort of contractive behavior, covering yourself up, wanting to hide. This is what you, happens when you win the silver medal in the Olympics, which should be a moment of great joy. But as we know, silver medalists are less happy than the other two. Uh, and, and so you see this kind of contracted behavior, but you also see that in the animal kingdom. So individuals that have the least power are the most likely to be holding themselves this way. Here you have uh, you know, dogs. The, the, the tail between the legs, and June and I both have a, a neurotic dog. <laughs> that holds the tail between the legs a lot. And it's, it, it is associated with cortisol spikes uh, in dogs. And there's just anecdotal evidence from dog trainers that splinting tails out uh, causes them to calm down. So you can actually get a kind of body-mind effect in animals. There's also a whole bunch of stuff on horses that's fascinating that I unfortunately don't have time to talk about today. Uh, more powerless posture, you see what happens. Uh, what, you know, I mean, look at how close they are to the ground. The, ha the hair is lying down, the tail is wrapped around. Here the ears are pulled back all the way. Uh, so when we feel powerful, we expand, and when we feel powerless, we shrink. But I, I think we should not limit thinking about that to uh, Body language. I think that we, I mean, we know that power also makes us speak more slowly. So we take more space. So we expand temporally. It causes us to share our ideas more. I mean, it basically causes us to expand in the world in many ways. And this matters. I think this relationship between expansiveness and power is really important when you throw gender into the mix. Um, so. We've done a, a bunch of research on this. Other people have studied this too. I, I want to focus really on one thing. Adopting these high power poses versus these kinds of poses for a short period of time makes people feel more powerful. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a body-mind feedback effect. Lots of other stuff is going on. But this, I think, to me, is more important than any of the other stuff. This is a pretty quick and easy thing to do. Uh, it doesn't only apply to big, expansive postures. It's true even for simple things like slouching or sitting upright. So I mean, the posture of the person on the right is the posture of somebody who is depressed. And now we have evidence, again, not, not our own work, uh, showing that just having people sit upright makes them happier. It, it, it causes them to remember more positive things from their lives. Uh, so it's a very, very simple relationship. Uh, in school, kids who are taught to sit more upright and expansively perform better in school, especially on creative writing tasks, which I find fascinating because that's so much about revealing who you actually, you actually are. Um, one of the problems with this is this. Uh, we, we are now, our posture has gotten much worse, and I, I won't spend much time on this, but, but in the last you know, 10 years or so, physiotherapists have begun to see uh, what they call dowager's humps in 15-year-old you know, boys. So this horrible posture that comes from spending a lot of time sitting like this. So we are definitely seeing shifts in people's posture, and that seems also to be related to power-related variables. So when people are sitting in this, in this way, they feel less powerful, and they, they behave less assertively. 
so that's um, I, uh, problematic. I'm going to skip through that. Uh, so, okay. So power activates the approach system. Power causes us to expand physically, temporally, even I would say psychologically, because it it allows us to let our guard down, right? So we are we are sort of we are allowing our minds to be a bit more free when we feel more powerful. Expanding causes us to feel more powerful and others to see us more powerful and likable in some context. Now there have been a few studies recently that I think are interesting. There was the um, the recent PNAS paper on. Uh, on expansive posture in, in uh, online dating pictures. Do you guys know this paper? So this was, um, I know Eli Finkel was on this paper, Dana Carney was on the paper. And the idea was that um, in online, in pictures of online dating, people who had more expansive posture, not extreme expansive posture, but were seen as much more appealing, both genders, right? So it wasn't just men. Um, there's there's a, a, a recent, meta-analysis by Laura Tedens that looked at what, what things prevent stereotype backlash for women. So what are the things that women can do if they're in positions of power in particular uh, or in, sort of in, in more masculine professions to prevent this backlash effect of being seen as unlikable because you're strong? It turned out the best predictor was sort of dominant body language. So women who use more, and I don't, again, not overbearing, not like I'm challenging you to a dual body language, but just upright, making eye contact, reaching out. Women who did that were much less likely to experience stereotype backlash. So there are clearly benefits to expanding, and it's not about manspreading, right? It's not, I'm not saying that anyone should do that because no one should do that as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's, it's just not a good idea. Here's the problem. We know instantly, and, and there, there's plenty of research on this, but you don't even need to see the data to know there's a gender difference, especially among adults, in how people carry themselves. Women are much less expansive than men. Um, and you, you, know, you, you see that to greater or lesser degrees in different cultures, but there really aren't any cultures where you don't see that at all. Uh, so that's troubling. Um, here's just, let me just show you one, one study that we've been doing some work with a guy named Nico Troya, who runs, uh, it's called the Biomotion Lab. And what he does is looks at, he basically uses motion capture to study movement and how it relates to different emotions. So we found that this is, so, what, so people watch, uh, they watch these walkers and it's basically, it, it is moving. I'm trying to kind of show you moving in the, movement in these static images, but what happens is that he aggregates across thousands of people. So you're watching sort of all of these different, you, you, you get continuous dimensions of movement that you can slide around. And so we showed people thousands of these walkers. Um, and what we found was that these were the ones that they saw as more powerful. So the ones who were more expansive, uh, they held their arms out more, the strides are longer, they had more expansiveness vertically in their movement, more horizontal expansiveness. It was expansive movement. It was seen as dominant and powerful. It also, though, was seen as masculine, right? So it's it, a little bit, this is what, what, what was seen as the most powerless walker, and it's also seen as obviously very feminine, right? So. That's, that's one piece of evidence, but this is the thing that really concerns me the most. My son's 13, and when he got to middle school, I noticed something. His female friends at the same age, same time, started to collapse. They started to kind of you know, hold, wrap themselves up. They'd like pull their long sleeves down over their hands and you know, touch their faces and pull, pull, sort of pull in their hair and do things that made them seem powerless. The boys were not doing that. I mean, you've got the iPhone problem with all of them, but the boys were not doing this contractive stuff that the girls were doing. And, and it really hit me that before that age, there really isn't a gender difference. Girls and boys are throwing their arms up in the air. They're doing cartwheels. They're not worried about that. It's not till they hit that age. So we wanted to kind of get at when kids learn this. Even if they, they so do they learn it before they start expressing it? Or, you know, is it just, is this just, uh, is it just nature? And that's all there is to it. So we had kids look at 16 pairs of photos like this. So there's always a powerful and a powerless doll, an expansive and a contractive one. We asked, we did, we did two studies, one with four-year-olds and one with six-year-olds. We chose those ages because around age five, kids start to strongly identify uh, with gender. So, and and the, the characteristics, that, the stereotypic characteristics of gender. Um, 
So we, we were curious to see if we'd see a change from age four to age six. So they looked at these pictures, and the, the task was simple. I'm not a developmental psychologist. This is the first developmental study that I've done. And I understand that developmental studies with kids can be pretty tricky when they're young because they don't get the instructions, and so you don't know what you're getting. This was not hard for them. We just said to them, which one's the boy and which one's the girl? So they looked at 16 of these. They had an iPad. They just touched the boy, touched the girl. They flew through this. They, they knew the answers. That's how they felt. They thought it was like a game, and they knew all the right answers. So this is what we find. In four-year-olds, 75% see an expansive male bias. In six-year-olds, it's 85%. But this is more alarming. At age four, 13% had a perfect score, meaning for every 16 of those pairs, they thought the expansive one was a boy. At age six, that's around 45%. So you're seeing definitely an, an increase uh, in this association. So I think this is troubling. Uh, to me at least, and I do think that we have sort of tethered expansiveness to masculinity. And I think that what happens around middle school is that girls start to really become afraid of looking like boys, right? And you see them starting to collapse. We know that that's not good for them. Well, it's not good for them physically. It's not good for them psychologically. It's not good for them in how they're perceived by others. It's basically activating this inhibition system. We don't want this to happen. So I, you know, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of leaving you with a question, which is, what do we do about this? Uh, I think that we have definitely made the mistake of showing our kids way too many images of women being contractive and fragile and that being the appealing thing to see. So um, I used to be a ballet dancer. And in the classical ballets, I, just, I think ballet is a great, I mean, it's so, such a feminine discipline. But the lead character, the lead female characters in classical ballets are all, you know, pale and fragile. And usually the character is, and I'm not kidding, either dead or half dead. Mm -hmm. So we think about like Giselle and and Swan Lake and Capelia and all of these classical La, La Bayadere, they're all dead, or they die by the end, collapsed on the ground. So that's the image of beauty, right? Is the, <laughs> this you know, dead woman who's using this kind of body language. The ones that get to use the expansive posture are the evil alter egos, who are also, by the way, usually dressed in black, which is troubling in, in, in another domain. Um, but I think that we need to show our kids more images like this, you know, of women who unapologetically are carrying themselves with power and pride. And I, you know, I, this is kind of silly, and I was really sad that they call it Supergirl because she's like 25 years old, but, uh, but, but I was glad that they didn't put her in a Wonder Woman costume and that they chose somebody who's muscular and, and you know, powerful and willing to sort of, sh to, to, to showcase that kind of appearance at least. I hear all the time from coaches, from uh, sports coaches, and what they say is, that their male athletes are much more likely to just sort of know to use expansive posture before meets or before races or before games. The female athletes are less likely to do that. So they've been using this sort of power posing intervention with athletes and having tremendous success with it. So just teaching people, to, teaching women to do this. This is a program that a, a guy started uh, when he saw his daughters hit middle school and start to do this collapsing thing. Uh, it's called Stand Like a Superhero. These are girls who are bullied. And, uh, and they practice doing this before they go to, go to school in the morning so that they feel maybe a little bit more grounded. Uh, but here's my very favorite image of a, uh, an expansive woman. So does anyone know who this is? So this is Misty Copeland. Uh, and, and it's kind of amazing. It's, it's wonderful to see that people even know who a ballet dancer is. And I'm so pleased that this is the one they know. So Misty Copeland, uh, she grew up in California. She's a, an amazing ballet dancer, always was tremendously talented. Um, but when she hit puberty and developed, oh my God, breasts and hips and muscles like adults do, all of a sudden she was told, you're not built for ballet. I mean, keep, look at that and say, you're not built to be a dancer. It's kind of crazy. But she was told that she was too masculine to be a ballet dancer. Uh, she kept almost quitting and she would get back in the saddle because she realized that she had this opportunity to be a role model, to say, um, you know, 
you don't have to be a toothpick. You can still do this. But what I, what I most like is that she carries herself so unapologetically with, this, with expansiveness and power and poise at the same time. So I think that we need to work on this. I don't know what the answer is. You know, I think that exposure is obviously the beginning, but there's a lot more to be done here. Um, and I'm going to, these are very short talks, right? So I will finish, uh, and I'll leave you with this uh, from Maya Angelou, who I think uh, had almost everything right, certainly one of the wisest people that, I, that I've ever known about. And she overcame enormous challenges, but, but she certainly, I think, nailed this one. Stand up straight and realize who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. And I think we need to be sending that message to our daughters. Um, obviously to our sons. And I'm not saying men should be less expansive at all. I'm saying women should be more expansive. And somehow we need to, we need to get, get our daughters there. So I will leave you there. Thank you. And thanks for waiting.